tools that support resilient nature-based uh, water management. Uh, but just to start with some brief introductions, so uh, my name is Aaron Neal, I'm a postdoctoral research associate at the Institute of Hazard Risk and Resilience at Durham University in the UK. And my research focuses on sort of water quality issues, particularly nutrients, but also microbial, and the development of a variety of modeling tools to help understand where in the landscape pollutants are coming from and the processes responsible for transporting them. I'm also interested in uh, sort of ways of engaging with stakeholders and communicating model results, and one way is through use of virtual reality. Um, so my talk today is going to be around sort of modeling tools that we are. Um, just some background on my institute. Um, we're an interdisciplinary institute that integrates physical and social sciences across the broad range of hazard risk and resilience issues. Uh, we sort of specialize in taking research into practice, so that's through the development of decision support tools, but also through outreach and sort of uh, engagement with stakeholders. So obviously working with stakeholders is very important to this translation, and trying to be a responsive and collaborative space to respond to sort of funding calls and other opportunities across a range of disciplines. So in terms of the uh, overview for my talk, um, brief introduction to the problem and some of the nature-based solutions. Then moving on to sort of a brief conceptual overview of source pathways and receptors, because this underpins a lot of the modeling work that I'm involved in. I'll then give a brief overview of some of the modeling tools, and in particular, I'm going to introduce a tool called the SIMAP, um, which is something that's been developed at Durham. And I'm going to do this by actually applying it to the Odo River Basin and showing you how the tool works. Then talk about some other tools and communicating with the R and then summarize them. So the problem, nature-based solutions. We all know that water quality is a global problem. Um, it impacts countries across the spectrum of developmental levels. Um, but perhaps compared to other issues such as flooding and droughts, it hasn't necessarily historically had the same level of, sort of vision as some of those other issues, at least perhaps in the UK context at least. Um, and this, this map here just sort of integrates a few different water quality um, parameters to show where there are high risk areas um, of uh, water quality risk across the world. Uh, this was compiled by the World Bank in their report, The Invisible Water Crisis. So we can see, you know, a large proportion of the world, as I say, across different developmental levels, is at a high risk of impaired water quality. We're also aware that future pressures, some of which are starting to happen now, are going to intensify these problems. So we've got growing populations, which puts pressure on sort of sewage infrastructure and water treatment. We've got climate change, um, and we've also got related to both issues of food security and the intensification of agriculture. So when we're talking about sort of the, the over, over um, catastrophe of 2022, along with the salinity increases, it was also low water levels, higher water temperatures, and the increase in nutrient fluxes that were responsible for allowing that algal bloom to develop to relate to the fish kill. So water quality is clearly then a current and indeed potentially growing problem that we need to address. And we've got a couple of ways we can look into the problem. So we can obviously focus with sort of point-based approaches. So this is more around, I guess, improving sewage capacity as we've heard already, uh, improving water treatment. But we also need to look at other sort of non-constructed um, interventions. And so these are the nature-based solutions. So working with actual natural processes to try and hold and store water and contaminants within the landscape. And this is also um, the method by which we can tackle diffuse pollution, which is related to things such as intensification of agriculture. So in terms of some examples of nature-based solutions, we could look at reforestation, um, the context of rewilding. Um, before I was at Durham, I was based in Scotland and did some work looking at the impact of uh, sort of regeneration of natural Scots pine forest and the impact this would have on water balance and how it increases water use within the landscape and how this could be a way of disconnecting sources of contaminants uh, through to river systems. We can also think about runoff attenuation features so we find where in the landscape water is concentrated and essentially we build a store where the water can collect and it gives time to new uh, contaminants to settle out. And we can also think about sort of weapon restoration or riparian restoration, and this sort of helps to filter out contaminants as water is passing through. But, as uh, Eva was saying, in order to make sure we have nature-based solutions that are effective, 
that are most cost efficient in the context of sort of limited resources and that are also acceptable to landowners and stakeholders, we need to have tools to help us say where in the landscape we should be building our nature-based solutions. So, as I say, so some of the tools that I've been working with at Durham help to try and sort of answer the question, at least in terms of where we should put our interventions within the landscape to most effectively sort of store and capture pollutants, disconnect them from our points of impact. Now, one of the key areas of one of the key concepts behind this is the source pathway receptor model. So, just in case anyone's unfamiliar, um, this is a conceptual overview. So, it considers sources or otherwise availability of pollutant in the landscape. So, where are fertilizers being applied, for instance, where we have livestock grazing, these sorts of questions. We then can think about mobilization. So, this is more relevant in terms of sort of sediment perhaps, where we need to think about how water can actually entrain, pick up the contaminant in question. We then think about the hydrological pathways, so usually overland flow is a very efficient uh, uh, conveyor of pollutant to our river systems for instance, but we can also have movement through groundwater as well. And then we need to think about the receptor, so our river, <coughs> Sea, for instance, or other water body. Now, if we combine source, uh, a location where there is a source of pollutant, there's ability for it to be mobilized, and there's a pathway that connects it to a receptor, we have what's known as the critical source area. So when we're thinking about where we should be putting our nature-based solutions, we want to be targeting these critical source areas and putting an intervention in the landscape that can say, okay, we're gonna reduce the availability of the source, or we're going to disconnect that source from our receiving water. So what are the sort of approaches available to us? So I see there's sort of a, a spectrum of different approaches that we can consider. Each is associated with a different resource cost, a scale of application, and degree of physical realism. So at one end, we can have modeling tools that require minimal information. So for instance, tools that use geographical information software and integrate readily available data to give a sort of rapid overview of where in the landscape pollutants might be coming from. So as I say, it's a rapid assessment, but usually these are some sort of average condition. We can also think about process-based models. So these are those that dynamically in space and time result water and fluxes of contaminant. And these are useful for uh, dynamic simulations and scenario analysis. And obviously we can go to the field and we can look what's going on in the landscape, but doing that over large areas is time and resource consuming. So the tools I want to talk about fall into these two categories. Um, and we should start with Sina. Um, and as I say, I'm going to talk you through how this could be applied, or how this has been applied actually, to the uh, Oda River Basin uh, as a way to introduce you to this tool. So SINAP was uh, developed by a colleague of mine, Dr. Simrini, also in the Institute at Durham. And SINAP is a um, geographical information system based tool. It's available as a web app in the UK, which is shown here, but it's also available open source in Saga GIS. It has minimal information requirements. I'll talk you through what it needs in a moment. It's used for rapid assessments over large areas. So uh, I think one this tool, for instance, has been applied over the whole of uh, Ireland. Um, you can also set up anywhere in the UK, and we uh, also be talking through the Odor application. Mm -hmm. It's driven by the terrain and by precipitation. So it's focused mainly with looking at how pollutants might be being transported by overland flow, and this is in principally influenced by terrain and precipitation patterns. And it gives you a spatial distribution of relative risk within the landscape. So it can say, for your catchment area, over here there's a high risk of there being a critical source area, over here there's a low risk. So then your next step is to go, okay, well I go and focus in on that area, look at what interventions might be useful or what other monitoring or modeling might be useful. So to apply this then to the Odo Basin, we need three inputs for sign up. Two of them are here, so we have a digital elevation model. So this is from the FABD again, which is a 30 meter global resolution model that uh, resolved to 50 meters here. 
And we have general precipitation patterns. So this is the annual rainfall total for 2020, um, as an example. And then we have our third input, which are land cover. So this is derived from 10 meter data, again, result of 50. So we have key land sort of covers, but water, forest and better, uh, wetlands, crops, built areas, and iron free grassland. Now, from the land cover map, we develop the parameters, the site map. So these are a series of risk weightings. So essentially, each land cover within the environment receives a weighting between zero and one. And the weighting describes how likely it is that land cover is associated with a particular pollutant type. So these weightings here are actually derived from a UK catchment, which is used here as an example. And they give you the, the relative risk of the different land covers shown here for the, the containing the source of nitrate. So we can see, you know, where we've got crop areas, these are obviously associated with the highest uh, relative risk, whilst uh, areas of the forest and bearer, uh, shown here in sort of the, the pale whitey yellow colour, uh, they're the low risk areas. So these parameters define the generation risk for sign up, so potential availability of sources. We then need to think about sort of the uh, risk of uh, hydrological pathways. So combining the other two inputs to the model, we have our elevation and we have our precipitation. From the elevation model, we can get an understanding of which parts of the landscape are likely to generate overland flow. And this is through what's called the topographic wetness index. And then we weight that by the distribution of rainfall to actually say, okay, these areas might be you know, likely to generate um, overland flow, but is there rainfall there? So the combination of these two together gives us this map um, of hydrological connectivity. So again, this is, gives every point in the landscape a value between zero and one that shows the likelihood that that point in the landscape is connect, connected by a continuous overland flow path to receiving water. So this is our delivery risk, and this is called the network index. The final step of SIMAP is simply a multiplication of generation risk and the delivery risk. So if you remember, critical source area is where there's a high likelihood of pollutant availability, which is shown here. We're not worrying about mobilization because nitrate is dissolved in water. And then we're thinking about hydrological pathways, which is encapsulated by the delivery risk here. So this gives us our locational risk, uh, and we, from this we can identify critical source areas. So this is the locational risk across the Oder River Basin. So you can see the areas in blue are those that are least likely to be contributing nitrate, whilst those in the orange and then through to red are like the sort of hotspots. So we can pick out a couple of locations, for instance, where we've got the highest relative risk. So we've got up here, sort of where there's some agriculture and some of the sort of uh, the lowland path areas, but also uh, up here as well, we've got some, some sort of pockets of high risk. And this map here is just shown for sort of the geographical context. So now, with this sort of result, um, it would be possible to maybe zoom in on these two areas, go and look in those locations, and try and sort of validate these predictions, think about what other data might be useful to, to sort of monitor the situation there, and then we could also look at employ, employing other more complex tools to look at what solutions might be useful. So, to give a sense of how long this took from downloading the data, which was all open source, formatting, running it through the model and processing, it took about five hours to do this for the ODA, uh, 50 meter resolution. So this is a very rapid assessment. This is also obviously the first cut of it, so the next things to do to sort of improve on this would be to integrate any existing data sets for water quality, to refine those risk weightings to make sure they're appropriate for this landscape. We're potentially going to do some ground truthing of the inputs to make sure they're reliable. But just in terms of sort of having a tool that can very quickly get from having nothing to something and then sort of building there, sign up is a very rapid assessment tool in that regard. So what is it? As I say, rapid assessment tool, it's time integrated, so it gives you a sense of the relative risk over time. So in this case, we looked at an annual scale. And it's driven by topography and rainfall. But SIMAP is not everything, it's part of the suite of tools, so it's not time dynamic, so it doesn't tell us on a particular day how things are changing, um, yet yeah, it's integrated over a time period. It's also not fully process based, so obviously the model assumes that the main driver of pollutants is transport, 
is topography in this overland flow generation. For something that's a reasonable assumption, but when we think about perhaps areas with agricultural drainage or other processes at work, SIMAP is not necessarily going to capture those issues. So, you know, it would be then that we'd have to zoom in and look at what other processes we might need to consider. Uh, it's also not quantitative, so as I said, it's all relative risk. You apply SIMAP to any catchment, you'll have a high risk area and a low risk area. If you actually though want to say, okay, this means this much water or this concentration of pollutant, SIMAP can't give you that answer, but there are process-based tools that can. So let's talk about those. There we go. So as I say, process-based tools are starting to move up in complexity. These are able to simulate the physical processes to dynamically resolve stores and fluxes of water and pollutants within space and time. So typically these work by taking our catchment area and dividing it up in some way, perhaps with a spatial grid. And just for the purposes of what I'm going to talk about next, we can take these three grid cells, black, green, and blue, um, as examples. So typically, uh, process-based models are what are called aggregative in nature. So to explain what that means, if we have our three cells, what happens is our cell generates a flux, it moves to the next cell, it's aggregated with what's already there, moves to the next cell, aggregates what's already there, and then finally moves to our point of impact. So by the time you reach your point of impact, the only thing you know about the spatial origin of your water or pollutant here is that it came from this cell, because everything that came up to that point has been mixed in along the way, and you can't say how much came from these upslope cells. So if we're thinking about nature-based solutions and targeting things within a landscape, this is not particularly useful because we can't say, do we need to act here because pollutants from here make it all the way to the stream? Or do we need to act here because actually stuff that's here gets deposited along the way? So one of the key tools that I'm particularly interested in is something called agent-based models. So to talk through what they mean, what they are, they consist of three components. We have agents. Now these are used to represent a quantity of water or a quantity of a contaminant. And our agents can have different characteristics, such as what pollutant they represent, where they've been in the landscape, and the transport processes they've experienced. And now we can track how these characteristics change through the course of a simulation. We have a simulation environment, as we would with another type of process model. And we have a set of rules that governs how this agent interacts with this environment. Now, because we can trace, uh, because we can track how the characteristics of an agent change in the simulation, what we can do is we can see how those agents have moved through a simulation. So, for instance, now instead of only knowing that what's here came from here, we can also see that our agent representing a pollutant in the green cell made it all the way to the point of impact, whilst the one in the black cell didn't make it. So if we were thinking about their nature-based solutions and where to act in the landscape, we could think about the area represented by these uh, cells and maybe not worry so much about the one up here. The other good thing about agent-based models is you can have multiple agents within the simulation. So if we're talking about potential multiple benefits within a landscape and how management might capture that, we can simulate, for example, water agents, nutrient agents, sediment agents, within one simulation, and we can then start to understand where in the landscape targeted interventions would help improve you know, all three of these constituent parts. So just to give a, a little bit of an example, uh, this is <coughs> a model called MAFIO, which I developed during my PhD, uh, and it was applied in Scotland. MAFIO stands for the Model for the Agent-Based Simulation of Fecal Indicator Organisms, which is very catchy. Um, and fecal indicator organisms are things like E. coli. So the model uh, basically represented within the source pathway receptor type framework sources of E. coli from livestock, so sheep and cattle, different hydrological transport processes, so um, we had also detachment of E. coli, so mobilization, then we've got infiltration, overland flow, exfiltration, and our point of impact being the river system. So this model, as I say, was applied to a small catchment in Scotland, um, about half a square kilometre, 
agriculture and nature and impacted by areas of degraded soil, causing seepages of contaminants in the stream. And just as some example outputs, maybe, yeah. Um, in terms of what uh, agent-based models can do, we can see here a time series of agents that were leaving the catchment. So because we were able to trace their characteristics, we can see how many were leaving, but we can also see the hydrological or sort of the processes that would have um, led to the agents reaching the stream. So we can see in this catchment, seepages from areas of degraded soil were very important. Overland flow was, you know, very specific in time when that was uh, an important factor. And direct deposition where livestock could actually act, uh, act, um, access the stream sort of had a low but constant um, contribution to the contamination issue through time. We can also label our agents to say whether they came from sheep or cattle, which might be useful for looking at things like uh, dose receptor models, so you know, potential prevalence of pathogens associated with these animals and what might happen if you were to consume the water. Um, and we can also uh, produce maps like this that show um, areas where uh, agents were directly deposited in the water, but also the spatial locations uh, that agents were sourced from within the catchment. So again, if we wanted to look about where we uh, could apply nature-based solutions, for instance, there's actually quite a confined area um, that's contributing contaminants to the river in this case. So in terms of sort of looking at cost-effective solutions, you know, they can be quite specifically targeted, which would also be beneficial for you know sort of farmers and landowners through having only small interventions on their land. So to summarise, MAPIO, agent-based models in general. What is it? So process-based, it will give you fluxes of water contaminants. It will configure on, on, on those uh, simulated components. It's dynamic in space and time, and it gives us uh, an understanding of the sources and transport processes uh, within the landscape. What it is not is quick. Um, Matthew was simulating on the order of millions of agents, um, and over a half square kilometer area, this still took about eight hours to simulate. Um, but there are improvements in sort of um, graphics card processing that will speed that up nowadays, so that's useful. Um, but because of this sort of slow application, it's not really for very large areas, and you do need sort of good data um, database behind it to sort of perform parameterization and confidence. So hopefully that sort of shows, you know, the, the sort of two opposite ends of terms of tools that are available to try and see from where in the landscape pollutants being sourced and the processes to guide nature-based solutions from SIMAP, which is very quick, very rough, well not rough, very quick application, and then things like MAPIO, which can help to zoom in and look more at the processes um, to guide solution selection. But also, as I say, one of the things we want to do is translate research into practice and in order to do that with these tools, we also need to think about effective ways to communicate model outputs to stakeholders, landowners, and so forth. So one of the things I'm looking into is how this, how virtual reality technologies could be useful in this manner. So I just wanted to finish with a brief sort of overview of that. So I don't know if you're how familiar everyone is with virtual reality, um, but one of the sort of uh, bits of tech, I guess, are the VR headsets. So yeah, this is me sitting trying out a, um, a Meta Quest 2. Um, so this is one of sort of the more affordable um, headsets. Um, affordable to start about 300 pounds, I think. But comparatively affordable. Um, and headsets are, you know, they're portable. And there's also functionality to meet with other people in virtual reality. So in terms of what this could do, this could be, you know, joining people from across the world within a VR headset to go and look at the landscape, to take a virtual field trip, to discuss the problems that are taking place. It could also be something that allows you to walk through a model output. So this is something that I'm trying to work on at the moment. This is a very sort of early stages um, uh, screenshot here. But this is also, this is taking um, an, uh, an output from the SIMAP model here by the catchment in Costa Rica. And it's uh, using a point cloud viewer to sort of uh, give each point in the landscape um, a, a color based on the risk that it represents. And sort of by integrating that with elevation data, you can sort of resolve the topography of the landscape. So the user of the, the, um, the headset or the web tool, whatever it might be, can actually walk their way through the model output 
and start to see where high risk and low risk areas are. And again, this could be done collaboratively. Um, another thing could be the use of virtual tours. So um, these give a 360 perspective on the landscape. Um, but for River University, actually, I have a 360 camera with me, so hopefully we can maybe wander out about to do some 360 uh, uh, videos and things. Um, yeah. So we can see, you know, that you get 360 perspective on the landscape. So this is actually a new housing development in the UK where they've uh, implemented sustainable urban drainage. Um, so you can see what's going on. You can then click on the different points, which take you to different viewpoint, which again shows you what's going on. So in terms of being able to guide someone through a space or highlight a set of issues and solutions, this could be a, an effective way um, that could be delivered across a range of different sort of um, uh, technologies. And then the final thing, um, which I think is quite exciting, um, is the use of shared virtual reality spaces. So this is a picture of me in a, a shared VR space in, in London. Um, we we're hoping to work with a company there who sort of create these virtual environments. Um, so this is me in London standing on a, an agricultural track um, in the Lake District in Northwest England. Um, so again, these are very sort of immersive spaces. You don't need to sit there with a headset on to see what's going on. And they're truly collaborative. So you have a group of people standing in one of these spaces to talk about what's going on in an environment, look at the problems, look at the solutions, and sort of discuss in a, in a truly collaborative way. So a lot of these things, I'd say, are quite early stages in terms of where I am with sort of working on how they can be used for stakeholder engagement, model integration. But I said, I think, um, you know, there's a lot of exciting potential there, and I wanted to include that sort of the next step from going from research model to product that we can actually share and discuss and talk with people. So just to summarize then briefly, I hope we've been able to sort of talk about the need for, for nature-based uh, water management and talk about some of the, the tools that we've um, sort of developed within the Institute Hazard Risk and Resilience at Durham, um, different complexity approaches and how these can give different insights into sort of the problem and potential solutions. And yeah, let's say I hope that um, you know in the coming months, years. Um, we'll have some exciting new VR content to share and um, that can help with this sort of uh, communication. So, thank you very much. Um, feel free to reach out to any of my contact users there. I'll also be there for the whole week so we can chat more. Uh, yes, thank you very much. <laughs>